Good afternoon. My name is Nick Hackney, and on behalf of the Concerned Lifers Organization, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our 2015 conference. We'd like to extend a special thanks to our superintendent, Mr. Obenlin, for giving us the opportunity to have this conference. We'd also like to thank Ms. Peterson and Mrs. Biller for all their help in facilitating this event. Ms. Peterson and I uh, may be ending the day in a big musical number, but we may not have time. We'll see how it goes. Right now we're a little behind, so uh, just hold on for that. Next, we'd like to thank all our sponsors and volunteers here today. These are the folks that make the volunteer programs happen in prison. You have our extreme gratitude. And a special shout out goes to Zoe for all her work putting this conference together on the outside. You are awesome. But we'd especially like to thank you, the guests, for spending time with us today. We truly ap appreciate your willingness to do this time in prison. Not everybody wants to come into a prison setting, and we appreciate you being here. So there's bottled water in the back. The guest restrooms are out that way along the hall and to your right. Inmate restrooms will funnel through where this fine officer is standing, Mr. Devine. And so inmates only on this end, guests in the back. We're not going to have any specific bathroom breaks, so just uh, go as the spirit leads you. The title of today's conference is The Voices of Mass Incarceration. And we recognize that's a very ambitious subject to address in the next few hours. Mass incarceration has become a very popular catchphrase today. It describes this condition that America has arrived at, as the undisputed global leader in imprisonment. But mass incarceration encompasses a much broader spectrum of people than just those in prison. Whole factions of the American population have been impacted, and none more disproportionately than black and Hispanic communities. Communities that send their young men to prisons at rates eight times higher than white communities. Some would argue that mass incarceration has begun to undermine the very fundamentals of the democracy that our country is founded on. Others decry the cost of mass incarceration and its impact on the ability to fund education, mental health services, and other, other vital social programs. Volumes of material have been written about mass incarceration. It's a major talking point for national political campaigns. And unlikely allies such as the Koch brothers and the Center for American Progress are coming together to fund movements to address the nation's broken criminal justice system. But in all the noise about mass incarceration, there's one voice that's rarely heard. The voices of those convicted of violent crimes and sentenced to the longest terms of imprisonment in the world. In state prisons across the nation, more than half of the prisoners are serving sentences for violent offenses, while less than 17% are serving time for nonviolent drug offenses. More than 180,000 American prisoners woke up this morning in a cell with the realization that they are serving a sentence that they simply cannot survive. Hundreds of thousands more have sentences that will ensure they are old men and women long before they are released. It is our position that the solutions to mass incarceration must include addressing those prisoners convicted of violent offenses and sentenced to the longest incarceration. Today, you will hear some of those voices. About 40 years ago, a series of policies began to be implemented in this country to move away from a rehabilitative model to a punitive one. Lock them up and throw away the key. Do the crime, do the time. Truth in sentencing and three strikes you're out became slogans that politicians on both sides of the aisles turned into legislation favoring punishment over rehabilitation. For nearly four decades, we've had a stream of laws that have increased both the severity and the length of punishment, while at the same time defunding corrective tools such as education, treatment, and reentry programs. A narrative have, has been adopted that claims American prisons have exactly the right people incarcerated, the most horrible criminals. So as you sit here today, you are most likely within a few feet of the very men that commentators would identify as the worst of the worst. People convicted of violent crime and sentenced to decade after decade of imprisonment, and for many, to lifelong death sentences. These are the men that society has said are unredeemable, 
men who are portrayed on a myriad of television shows as evil monsters. For myself, I found many of the men in this room to be much different than I expected when I came to prison 14 years ago. I met incredibly gifted artists, writers, poets, devoted fathers and grandfathers, men who have overcome horrific childhoods, poverty, racial disparity, and bias to become articulate, caring people. Men who carry daily a visible regret and remorse for the wrongs they have done. Men I am proud to call my friend. Today you'll hear from some of them, and you can decide for yourself. Today, as you listen, we'd like you to consider this question. Is it possible that despite the terrible mistakes of the past, that many of the men and women in prison have found their way to redemption? And if so, what should society do about it? Now in your informational handout, you'll find information and a schedule for the day. In preparation for this event, members of the CLO have spent a great deal of time reading through a variety of books, articles, and reports on mass incarceration. Throughout the day, members are going to be coming up and reading excerpts from some of those reports, as well as introducing themselves to you. You will also hear from four prisoners. And then for the second part of the day, we will all participate in a town hall meeting. Once again, we can't thank you enough for spending this time with us.